thanks. Uh, this talk is not going to be about optimization. Uh, so I just finished my PhD at UT Austin under the supervision of Scott Aronson. And I'm starting, uh, well, just a couple weeks ago as a postdoc in the quantum pod. Um, I'll be here for the next couple of years. And today I'm going to tell you about um, some work based uh, in part on joint work with Lo Wen Chen, Makran Sinha, and Avi Shaital on the possibility of building uh, quantum cryptography without one-way functions. Um, the title of this work, Quantum Cryptography and Algorithmica, refers to one of Impagliazzo's five worlds, which uh, presumably many of you are familiar with. Um, these are basically five possible resolutions to the P versus NP problem that were introduced in this influential survey about average case complexity uh, in the 1990s by Russell and Pagliazzo. Uh, and these five worlds range all the way from algorithmica, where P is just equal to NP, and so a wide range of problems can be solved efficiently in polynomial time, all the way down to cryptomania, where P is different from NP in such a strong sense that you get really uh, powerful cryptography like public key encryption. And if you're a classical cryptographer, uh, you generally hope that we live somewhere below this line uh, in either mini crypt or cryptomania because what characterizes uh, whether you're above or below this line is the existence of one-way functions, which are widely seen as being the minimum computational assumption that you need in order to get interesting classical cryptography. And uh, just to remind you, because presumably not everyone here is a cryptographer, uh, a one-way function is just a function that's uh, easy to compute, but it's hard to invert. So for any polynomial time adversary, uh, given f of x for random input x, it should be hard for the adversary to find uh, a pre-image of that function with better than negligible probability. And the reason why one-way functions play such a central role in classical cryptography is that, uh, as I kind of alluded to earlier, they're both you know, widely seen as necessary, but also in a way sufficient for wide swaths of classical cryptography. Necessary in the sense that for pretty much any super polynomially secure uh, classical crypto system, you can generally show via a reduction that if that crypto system, uh, if a secure instantiation of that crypto system exists, then you can build 1A functions from it. Uh, but conversely, 1A functions actually also turn out to suffice for uh, a lot of interesting cryptography including things like pseudo-random generators, pseudo-random functions, uh, digital signatures, and commitment schemes, to give a few examples. And uh, kind of the question we ask is that, you know, in the classical world, 1A functions seem to be the minimal computational assumption that we can make to get cryptography. What happens in the quantum world? And in particular, are 1A functions necessary in the quantum world, both in the sense of you know, are one-way functions themselves still the minimal computational assumption that we need for quantum cryptography? Uh, and if not, then what really are the, the minimal assumptions that we can make that would allow us to build uh, secure quantum cryptography? And um, already in the quantum world, some interesting phenomena rear their heads. Um, for example, there are these, these protocols, uh, like this one on the left, the, the so-called uh, BB84, uh, quantum key distribution protocol that was introduced by Bennett and Bazard, where they showed that uh, two spatially separated parties, Alice and Bob, who share an unsecured quantum channel can securely exchange a secret key over that channel in a way that cannot be learned by any eavesdropper um, who, who listens in on that channel, where uh, the security proof of this is actually unconditional. So it's an information theoretic proof, relies on no computational assumptions, this is obviously something that we cannot do classically, right? Classically, if you want uh, key distribution, uh, that, then you need to make some sort of computational assumption. Uh, I won't talk about this other example on, on the right, but uh, this is sort of another example of something you can do quantumly that you can't do classically involving quantum money. So certainly in the, in the quantum setting, if we allow cryptographic protocols that are implemented via quantum communication between the parties, then already you can start to do things that you can't do classically. Um, but this is not the end of the story. So we can't just hope to build everything uh, via a similar proof where you just have information theoretic security because you can show that for most cryptographic tasks that we care about, you still need to make some computational assumptions on the adversary. In other words, you cannot have information theoretic proofs, uh, including things like symmetric key encryption, commitment schemes, and digital signatures, these 
sort of mini primitives that we know how to build classically from one functions, uh, but also for some of these like stronger kind of uh, inherently quantum primitives like uh, publicly verifiable quantum money or quantum copy protected software, again, you can show that you cannot have information theoretic instantiations of these primitives. So where does that leave us? Well, you know, one thing that's, that, that people have basically tried to do in recent years is they've tried to say, okay, what if we, you know, define quantum analogs of these classical cryptographic primitives like 1A functions or pseudorandom generators, then maybe we can both try to see A, can we build cryptography from those quantum analogs? And B, can we try and understand you know, what computational assumptions you need to, to actually build those primitives? And um, a, a very well-known example of this, maybe kind of the first uh, that was introduced recently uh, was in this paper by Ji Lu and Song in 2018 of what are called pseudo-random quantum states. And intuitively, you can think of pseudo-random quantum states as being kind of a quantum analog of classical pseudorandom generators. So um, it's an, uh, a keyed ensemble of quantum states that you can generate efficiently. Uh, and it has this computational indistinguishability criterion, which just says that uh, for any polynomial time adversary, the adversary cannot distinguish copies of a random straight drawn from, uh, drawn from the pseudorandom ensemble from copies of a, a uniformly random or uh, sometimes called a har random quantum state. Uh, and indeed, there's really basically only two differences compared to uh, the definition of pseudorandom generators. Uh, one is that rather than trying to mimic the uniform distribution over n bit strings, you're trying to mimic the uniform distribution over n qubit quantum states, the, the Haar measure in red. Uh, and the other difference in blue is that in general, we will allow the adversary to have access to any polynomial number of copies of the state that it wants. Uh, this is kind of justified by the no cloning principle in quantum mechanics where you can't take an unknown quantum state and produce a copy of it. So we might as well um, you know, see what happens if we give the adversary more copies since in some cases that lets the adversary do uh, things that otherwise could not. Um, and there's kind of three big reasons why we, uh, well, why pseudorandom states have gathered so much attention in recent years. Uh, the first is that they actually suffice for a lot of these uh, quantum cryptography things uh, that we can build from uh, 1A functions, and in fact, even some things that we don't know how to build uh, from 1A functions alone. Um, but they suffice for things like uh, commitments, some form of digital signatures, some, uh, some sort of secure multi-party computation, and computational zero knowledge, uh, again, all involving some form of quantum communication between the parties. Uh, it has also been shown that the existence of pseudo states is actually implied by 1A functions. So if you believe that 1A functions exist, or at least if you believe that quantum secure 1A functions exist, you should certainly believe that pseudorandom uh, states also exist. Uh, they are no stronger a computational assumption. And finally, there's uh, some evidence, some, some recent evidence to suggest that perhaps uh, pseudorandom states are actually a, a plausibly weaker assumption than 1A functions. And this is going to be uh, what I'm going to talk about for, for the rest of this. This is uh, what my work really touches on. And um, uh, what I can show in, in these, you know, uh, a couple of works, one by myself in 2021 and one with some co-authors from this year, what we can show is that in the black box setting, uh, you can actually construct worlds where uh, NP is easy, so there are no 1A functions, and yet nevertheless you have pseudorandom states. Uh, so there's the sort of two versions of this result, one that uses a, a quantum black box or a quantum oracle where we can show that, you know, BQP and QMA, which are kind of the quantum generalizations of P and NP, coincide, and yet, nevertheless, you still get pseudorandom states relative to this oracle. Uh, and similarly, in, uh, with, in the more uh, standard classical black box setting, we can construct a black box world where uh, P is equal to NP, and yet, nevertheless, you still have pseudorandom states. And hence, by the reductions, uh, by the security reductions that have been shown in other work, you get a wide range of quantum cryptography, e even though uh, since P equals NP, you don't get classical cryptography. Uh, and in fact, we actually even so show something uh, stronger in the second result. We basically introduce a concrete hardness property of a cryptographic hash function that both uh, simultaneously, it, yeah, it, it like plausibly holds for existing cryptographic hash functions, but it also is independent of the P versus NP problem. So, so this is kind of surprising. This is saying we can have quantum cryptography without classical cryptography, 
or you know, putting another way, uh, if we go back all the way to, to the first slide, where you know, classically, uh, you know, uh, super polynomial secure cryptography is unthinkable anywhere above this line. Uh, quantumly, it's actually consistent with our knowledge that you could still have uh, secure quantum cryptography based on pseudo atom states all the way up here, uh, which is pretty remarkable. You said, you said you said a concrete pseudo random assumption? Or you have some concrete. Uh, yeah, there's like a, a concrete assumption you can make of, of a cryptographic hash function like SHA3, where we show that this property implies the existence of secure pseudo random states, but this property is also independent of the P versus NP problem. Um, and I guess I'll wrap up by just talking about you know why, what I think are some of the most kind of important research directions for future work. Um, I think the first one is kind of can we get other plausible instantiations of pseudo random states that you know very clearly don't rely on one way functions in any way because you know in some sense the, uh, the the one I mentioned earlier it still kind of relies on like some sort of cryptographic hash function. And while you are using a different property of this, this hash function than what we normally use in classical cryptography, you know, it would be interesting to, to, if we could see like whether you know, there are other constructions of pseudo-random states that really you know, cl clearly are not going through the, these types of uh, hardness assumptions. And uh, finally, I think what I think is maybe the most important question is do any of these quantum cryptographic primitives imply uh, a classical hardness result, like, like a standard complexity theoretic hardness assumption, like P is different from P space. Um, for some of these cryptographic primitives, we can show something like this. So for the version of pseudo random states that I defined here, uh, you can actually show that if pseudo random states exist, then you get uh, P, uh, actually P is different from uh, P to the sharp P. But uh, for other things, like for example, for, for uh, commitments, uh, we don't know actually whether you can tie the existence of such a quantum cryptographic primitive back to a classical complexity hardness assumption, and uh, yeah, whether we can close that gap or whether you know quantum uh, complexity assumptions really are just something separate. I think is is a really uh, interesting question, and I think I will stop there. I'd be happy to take any questions. Questions? So there were fairly recent results uh, in meta complexity relating one way functions with uh, conditional Kolmogorov complexity. Mm -hmm. Is there anything like that known for quantum setting? Good. Um, not that I'm aware of. I will say that like some of those meta complexity results were kind of exactly the kinds of questions that got me motivated about these questions originally, because I was wondering like, you know, can we, can we tie like, uh, you know, the hardness of quantum cryptography back to some meta complexity assumption? And uh, that was like how I came upon this first result actually. But, but yeah, actually I don't, I don't really know. Um, that's a good question. Yeah, I think in general kind of quantum meta complexity is in my opinion, a bit understudied. I think that there's there's a lot of big questions there. It was a reading group on quantum meta complexity in spring. Hmm. Some, mm -hmm. some relations between meta complexity. Any other questions? Well, I'll ask one more. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you want. Yeah. Between us and lunch, so. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to hold things up. But there was this example, uh, I, I guess something quantum money or something that you, you didn't explain at the very beginning of your talk. Oh yeah. So, yeah, so so the quantum money example, so you can basically, um, you can mint banknotes using quantum information that are physically impossible to counterfeit. Um, so, so if you allow the, the banknote to be you know, stored as a quantum state by like polarizations of photons or something, which is quite you know, impractical from an engineering standpoint, um, but you know, theoretically it's interesting. I should note that the, the quantum key distribution protocol is actually a lot more practical uh, so this picture, uh, these protocols have actually even been demonstrated between like a ground station and a satellite, which is pretty remarkable. All right, probably take other questions offline. Um, so thank you. Thank you.